In today's lesson, we're going to discuss whether we should focus on process or results as musicians. Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in today. In this lesson, we're gonna cover a little bit of kind of different material, not necessarily directly related to playing our instrument, but instead thinking about how we set up our practice in order to improve in the most efficient way. So on one hand, we have the processes that we set up in order to help us improve. Those can be a lot of different things, almost infinite number of things, just like this egg might become an infinite number of different things. I might scramble it, I might poach it, I might bake it into a cake, I might stick it in the ground and hope that a chicken tree is going to grow. Now, some of those things are more likely to happen than other ones, but they're all possibilities when we think about the processes that we set up to practice. Now, on the other hand, we have our results. Just like this chicken is a result of this egg. These results can also be a number of different things. I might roast this chicken, I might fry this chicken, I might make chicken soup. But once I cook this chicken, it is gone. And once I consume it, I can never get it back. It might be tasty and delicious, but it's very fleeting. Now these two things work together. The processes we set up affect the results that we have, and we can't have one without another. They work together. In today's lesson, we're going to explore how to set these things up in our own practice to have the best results possible. But we're delving into whether we want to think more about the processes we set up or the results we get in order to kind of put our practice into context. We really don't want to think it's a zero-sum game, as I mentioned. Both these things are important, and they do different things for our playing. The important thing to keep in mind is that focusing too much on either of them, focusing on too much kind of the process part of practice or too much on the results, can lead us astray and can lead to some common problems. So let's explore these just a little bit. Let's start with the results. The things that focusing on results really helps us with is it can help us motivate our practice to kind of set a goal and try to achieve towards that. It can be a way to put our practice into context. Um, it can be hard to practice in a vacuum. And if we have a specific thing floating out there in the future that we're working towards, it can really help to focus that, figure out what we need to practice it, how we need to practice it, and really put thing, everything in context for us. The final way that results can work in our favor is it can be a great reward for us um, if we end up getting the results we want. Uh, it's a great way to kind of have a little carrot out there. So if we do a good job, it feels good to have that good result that we've kind of set the goal for. Now let's talk about the flip side of that and talk about some of the problems that can come from focusing too much on the results side of the equation. The biggest one that I think comes to mind for me is we can get a little bit burned out. If we're just thinking about the next audition, the next competition, even just the next performance sometimes, it can lead to us just feeling like we're on kind of a hamster wheel of uh, trying to get to the next thing and we don't really see improvement because we're always just chasing that next thing. So we gotta be very careful when we're looking at results that we don't kind of like burn out just trying to get to that next end result. I mentioned how oftentimes prepping for the next performance or whatever, we can sometimes actually end up pandering a little too much to that. So instead of actually thinking about how do we improve our whole musicianship over time, we just think about, well, what do I need to do to play this next concert successfully? What do I need to do to kind of get this next audition? And rather than thinking how these things work together to make us whole musicians, we just end up thinking about what do I need to do for this very narrow set of circumstances? And sometimes that doesn't lead to growth in the way that we might want to see it. The final problem with focusing just on results is results are very fickle and very transient. We don't always get the results we want, right? Sometimes we get that audition and we win the audition. Sometimes we have a good performance. However, sometimes we don't. We don't always win the audition. We don't win the competition. We don't have a good performance. And we have to figure out ways to deal with those situations. Now, even if we do have good success, those feelings often don't last for very long. I think all of us have probably experienced having a good performance or having a good result. And while that feels good for a short amount of time, a lot of times that feeling can be kind of hollow or empty. And so we need to find ways to motivate ourselves to practice outside of just looking for positive results. All right, that is the results side of things. Now let's look at the process side of things and thinking about how the process can kind of help us improve as musicians. 
For me, I've always been somebody who's maybe a little bit more focused on the process, and that's where I really find most of my drive. And the biggest thing why this is important to me is that this is sustainable over a long period of time. Now, I'm somebody who's in music making for the long haul, so I want something that is going to be able to sustain me through my entire career and kind of keep pushing me forward. So if we set up good processes in our practice and in our musicianship, we can have good sustainability in improving over our career. Now, just like our results help to put our practice into context, our processes that we set up can actually help put those results into context. Um, whether we had the right results or whether we had results we weren't so happy with, we can look back at the processes that we set up and say, oh, well, I can actually see that when I got the result I wanted, I was doing these things. Maybe I'll keep trying to do those things or the converse. If you don't get the result you wanted, uh, you can look, oh, I see I didn't really do these things that in hindsight, maybe I should have. Let me try to incorporate some of that stuff into my practice or into the processes that I'm setting up. The final thing here about the pros of us thinking about the process of our practice, and this one's maybe a little, I don't know, touchy-feely, this sort of um, thought process is really a lifelong companion to you as a musician. Um, for me, I really think I have a relationship with music making and a relationship with my instrument, and that goes up and down like any relationship does, but it's always there for me when I need it. And I think that's something that a lot of musicians uh, find really important about the act of music making. Okay, there are some of the good things about thinking about our processes. What about some of the not so good things about thinking about our processes? If we focus too much in this area, it can lead to not having a real sense of urgency in our playing and in our practice. We can become kind of complacent and we just focus on like the daily routine of doing my long tones, working on some scale stuff, you know, playing Roshu, whatever, um, without a real goal out there to help motivate us to the next level in our playing. Additionally, we might also just kind of lose track of why we're practicing in the first place. If there's not a performance out there, uh, something that we're trying to achieve, practice can become just kind of mundane, lackluster. We kind of forget why we're making music in the first place. Most of us are not playing just to kind of practice at our homes or in our basements or whatever. We are practicing in order to perform for people and share this art form with them. And we can lose track of that if we just focus on the processes that we're setting up. Okay, cool. So that's kind of some of the pros and cons. Let's actually look at this in action. The first thing we're going to explore are the results side of things. And in this case, maybe results that haven't been so good. Um, looking at maybe a failure in order to help put this into context. So this is an EP, a short album that I released in the late, mid to late winter of 2020. Now, that is not a great time to have released a project. Regardless of things going on with COVID, this release was not a success in my mind's eye. I wasn't able to get any interesting performance opportunities out of it. I didn't get very good traction with getting it reviewed or getting radio play. And just in general, this was, you know, mostly a wasted effort on my part, largely because of timing, but also because of some other things that were within my control. The question might be, why did this fail? In this case, I think I was too focused on just the results of making a good album. And actually, I think it is a good album. I think the music that is contained is, is great. It's some of my best recorded work to date. However, I was too vague with what I was really looking to get out of this. I didn't have a clear result that I had in mind other than just making a good album. That is not going to really be helpful for us. In addition to that, I don't think I set up the processes in order to market, promote, all that type of good stuff for this release in order to get it reviewed, get it radio play, all that type of stuff that goes along with releasing an album. So what did I learn from this? I learned that number one, I need to set a clear, realistic goal as the result that I'm looking for. And if I don't do that, it's a very low probability that I'm going to achieve that. Secondly, that goal needs to inform the processes that I set up in order to make it happen. In this case, I needed to think my goal was not just to release this album, but to have it be successful and kind of define what that me meant. Maybe get radio play, maybe get reviews, and then how do I go a step-by-step -step process to achieving those things? All right, now on the process side of things, we're gonna go to the horn a little bit here to talk about this. When we think about our process, we're really thinking about how we set up our practice or the process that we want to use to reach an end goal. For today's example, we're going to talk about building your upper register. This is something that most brass players need to work on at some time or another in their careers, and it's a good place to explore this discussion. The first thing we've got to think about with this is why. 
why do we want to improve our range? What is our goal? Do we have a piece we want to play? Um, do we feel like our range is inhibiting us from playing certain music, getting work, getting gigs, whatever we want to do, but we need to have a real reason why. If you don't feel like you have a solid reason why, you could either question, well, why do I really want to set up a process to improve on this? Or you could think, I'm going to find a reason why, because I know this is important. Now, if we're thinking about range, we need to think about, can we have a realistic improvement over a certain amount of time? If right now your range is up to a high B flat, you're probably not going to be able to go all the way up to a high F in three weeks. That's probably just not going to happen. So make sure that you're keeping this realistic. So that is something that you can set up a process that will actually help you get there and you can have some amount of achievement there. For me, when I'm working on range, there's a couple of different things that I like to do. Um, there are some glist exercises where we start in sixth position, glist our way into first, kind of in the upper range, use some alternate positions. That's a pretty common one. I also like to do one where we sing the note, buzz the note, and then play the note um, on our horn. The last one that I like to do, and that's what we're going to talk about today, is using just a five to one kind of scale step moving chromatically up the instrument. All right, that is our process. We're going to use this five to one scale approach. What is our actual goal that we had set? Let's think we're maybe trying to work on the Rhenish excerpt. We know that goes up to a high E flat. That can be one of the challenges in that excerpt is making sure that that is feeling really confident. And so we make, all right, my goal is to play that high E flat confidently. Maybe right now I'm playing up to a C pretty confidently. So for this exercise, if we're going up to a C, we would start in a G and we'd play G, A, B, C. Now I'm particularly focusing on is my tone clear that entire time. And a lot of times I hold that last note just a moment longer to make sure it's very centered. And then I work my way up chromatically, trying to focus on a consistent feel and consistent airflow throughout the entire time. I really don't want to feel like I'm changing too much here as I go up. Now that takes up to our high E flat. If you're really working on Rhenish, you might actually want to try to extend just a little bit above that high E flat, maybe up to high F. So that E flat actually feels within your range. Um, that might be a step you might skip in your process. And you just think, well, I got up to high E flat, yet when I go to my audition, I still, you know, chipped that high E flat when I, when I got to playing Schumann. So if you maybe have to refine that process a little bit, you might find better results. All right, the final thing when we're thinking about our process is we have to trust it. We have to trust that if we have a good realistic goal, a good result in mind, that is something that we can achieve and we set up the correct processes to do so, we give ourselves an appropriate amount of time to do so, we are going to see results, very high probability of seeing results there. Um, there are no guarantees. You know, this is all just a matter of probabilities. Yes, you could practice uh, trying to get Rhenish working using these different high register approaches you could do that for whatever amount of time you determine to be appropriate. And you still might not be able to get that high E flat to sound really clear and focused when it comes time for the audition. But there's a really high probability that you're going to be much closer if you set up a good process, have a good result out in the future, and trust that those things are going to work together to help improve your playing. All right, we'll see you all in the woodshed.